we'll get there. Maybe we'll get there. Our speaker this afternoon is Professor John Sherry, uh, who is the chair of the Department of Marketing. He's occupied that position since 2005. Uh, he uh, is no stranger to Notre Dame. He started off at Notre Dame as a student in the College of Arts and Letters with a major in anthropology. Uh, and I think one of the things he's going to tell you is how that all fits in to life after being an undergraduate uh, and what he's done. I don't want to take any more of his time, so let's give Professor Sherry a big welcome. Thank you. I, I'm, I'll try to give you an overview of the field and, and tell you a little bit about our department. Um, answer whatever questions you have about uh, the curriculum, uh, careers, those kinds of things. So um, uh, a few minutes of talking at you and then a little bit of talking with you, I think. Uh, the most important thing to point out, and this is a wonderful technology I can actually read now without turning around, uh, is our website. We have a, a great website. I mean, the, the college website overall is wonderful. The marketing departments uh, in particular is crammed with interesting information, not just useful information, but we're trying to include more human interest stuff, right? Uh, more about students and faculty and so forth. So I, I really encourage you to, to visit our website, okay? I, I thought it might be interesting to start off by uh, just giving a, a, a quick marketing example, the kinds of things that, that we would find interesting uh, among the faculty in the courses that we teach and so forth. Um, the, the most commodified product you can imagine has got to be water, right? I mean, water is an absolute commodity. Um, I, I know in this culture, in blind taste tests, American consumers can't tell the difference between red wine and white wine. Right, let alone any particular versions of red or white. Imagine what it's like with water, right? I mean, we, we can't taste a difference. And yet, we've managed to brand water in so many different ways, right, that consumers feel that, that the water that they're drinking is, is literally, it's different, it's special. Their, their brand tastes different than all other brands. It's, it's interesting for a, a number of different reasons. Not, I mean, not only is it a branded product, we've infused it with meaning that it wouldn't otherwise have, right, and created a demand for it that it wouldn't otherwise have, but we've created a host of problems along with it, right? As, as bottled water becomes uh, uh, more and more distributed around the world, as it becomes more and more popular due to the branding efforts that we've made as marketers, it, it creates uh, lots of problems, right? We're, we're living in a world right now where we are just overwhelmed with plastic waste, right? It's, it's part of our environment, it creates a huge problem, and uh, because it's marketing created, it's, it's up to marketers uh, to solve this problem. Here's just a, a quick example. This is a, a, a picture of a, a, a decomposing bird that has just picked up scraps of, the mom picked up scraps of plastic thinking it was food, you know, fed it to the child, and, and the, you know, the, the bird eventually uh, uh, withered away and died, right? So the impact of marketing on the world, on the ecosystem, and so forth is profound. We're, we're not just in the business of changing price points and creating flashy uh, uh, commercials and so forth for the Super Bowl. We, we have a powerful impact on the world for, for good as well as for, uh, uh, for evil, right? Um, so again, just a, a quick example. There, there is a continent-sized mass of plastic floating around in the ocean. Right? That's a, a, a direct result of, of marketers having created for a, a demand for a product and consumers uh, you know, absolutely loving the product that marketers have created. It's, it's caused a number of, of different problems uh, for us. I kind of, from the sublime to the ridiculous, if we look at how products evolve over time, here's an example of, of a product that is so much of a commodity, so, so obvious and so necessary and such a tool that we never used to give much thought to it at all. It's a faucet, it's a fixture, right? It was designed to come with your house and to stay with your house forever. It would last for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. We, we never thought much about it other than to make it durable, right? Over time, marketers changed their attitude about what this thing was all about, right? So rather than just simply a water delivery system, right, a, a simple tool to get water into your environment, we started paying attention to what consumers actually did around the faucet, all right? And you've all been in a situation where you've gotten your hands all full of goo and muck and, and you don't want to actually touch anything in the environment. You don't want to touch the faucet because it's going to get this crap all over it, right? And so marketers design a product that allow you to just bump it with your elbow to turn it on, 
All right, we went from, from looking at this faucet as a tool to now looking at the behavior around it and taking into account what consumers are actually doing in the world to make a better product. All right, as we think about what water means, that water has symbolic essence in this culture, it has religious connotations, it has spiritual connotations, we factor that into the way that we think about products and services, all right? So you've got a company that says, all right, let's, let's look at fixtures in, in an even different way. Let's give it, let's give it uh, some symbolic cast. Let's talk about reflection, all right? You, there's lots of myths about people looking into water and reflecting and, and introspecting and so forth. So we make the water come out of the mirror, right? We, we eliminate the fixture entirely and, and we set up a little bowl there and we give it kind of sacramental quality, right? So we, we, we pay attention to the aesthetic dimension or the spiritual dimension, right? We, we make it an experience for consumers, all right? So we've created a brand, we've created demand for a product that causes problems. We take it from a tool to looking at the behavior to looking at its, its uh, kind of spiritual essence, all right? And then we go back to this, this plastic bottle example, we realize that it's, it's not enough just to take care of, of uh, functions and behaviors and aesthetics. There's an ecological impact, all right? So we go back to designing faucets that, that actually meter the water flow, right? That take into account the impact of, of uh, uh, water on the environment and our manipulation of water in the environment, and we design an even better kind of a faucet, right? So traditionally, Oh, and I'll give you a couple of more quick examples here. So this, this idea of waterness and, and an ecological view of marketing causes us to think about other ways that, that water can be accessed around the world. So here's an example of a, a straw that will purify drinking water. Here's an example of a, of a bike that will kind of get you around uh, from village to village and purify water at the same time so that your literal physical effort of pedaling produces clean water. The way we used to think about products is as needing to fulfill a function and then respond to the way that people behave and then to be beautiful isn't enough anymore, right? We have to take into account its ecological consequences as well, right? So if you're thinking about designing an ideal product, all of those different dimensions come into play, right? So as a marketer, you've got a, you've got a really challenging job. You can't just create a good product for any one constituency, right? There's lots of different stakeholders out there. Consumers may want things that aren't in their best interest to have, right? And that, and that sounds a little paternalistic, I suppose, but um, the idea that you as a marketer are not just a provider of goods and services, but that you're also a shaper of the environment and a, and a creator of a quality of life is really important, right? So when we train you in marketing, we, we get you to think like clinical business people where you're solving actual marketing problems but at the same time, we want you to, to be aware of the impact that you have as a marketer on the culture in which you're practicing and, and on the world at large, right? That there's a, a moral dimension to marketing. And as you'll see in a minute, as I go through the roster of our, uh, of our fac uh, faculty, that's an unusual positioning, right? Most schools don't spend much time at all on moral geography when they train business students, right? We're, we're more concerned with producing business people. Here we're producing business people, consumers and citizens all at once. And we try to un unfold that for you in a marketing perspective. All right, so here's, here's the definition that the, uh, the thought leaders of marketing currently use to describe what we do. It's an activity, set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. All right, it's not just a simple transaction between a buyer and a seller. There are all these stakeholders in the environment that, that need to be considered. And that last part of the definition, uh, uh, society at large, is largely a, a Notre Dame contribution. Right? Uh, uh, professors, researchers, and our faculty were instrumental in getting this built into the, the definition of marketing. All right, so, uh, and I'll visit some of those uh, uh, faculty members and their, and their specialties in just a second. I can never say this right, and make it come out right, so I'll, I'll let you read along as I try, right? Non-fat, half-calf, triple grande, quarter sweet, sugar-free, vanilla, non-fat, lactate, extra hot, extra foamy, caramel macchiato. You guys probably drink these things, right? And, and 
One of the things we do in the marketing department is ask what kind of a world is it that is concerned with this, right? That will produce a product like this. This, this satisfies a lot of your immediate needs for, for immediate gratification and, and sensual gratification and so forth. But what does it ulti ultimately produce, right? What, what kind of an attitude toward living does it, does it ultimately produce? I mean, you can you can get it in a Trente size now. So we've got we've got uh, literally big gulp Starbucks, da, 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 whatever that was I just described, right? Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It's both, right? It, it's got some positive consequences. It's got some negative consequences. And and so what we'll try to do is constantly challenge you to understand the impact of the decisions that you make as a marketer, not whether or not this is going to sell, because it's going to sell, right? It's selling right now but whether it should, right? Whether we can provide a better uh, kind of an offering. All right, when, when marketing gets described in the popular press, it usually is described something like this, the science of desire. We go out and try to figure out what it is consumers are doing, uh, observe their behavior patterns and so forth, and then design a product or a service that kind of meets the, uh, um, the, the unexpected or unanticipated needs that we're able to discover out there. And again, there are a million different ways to go about describing this kind of thing, but you guys have all been in a situation in, in popular discussions, right, where gender differences in shopping have come up. And there's plenty of guys that will take a long time in these stores and, and, and plenty of women out there that are surgical strikers and get in and out real quickly. But this is a cultural kind of a stereotype that we generally have. Marketing tries to understand these basic behavior patterns, what motivates them and whether or not we need to change them, all right? So, Right now, there's a lot of concern about figuring out male shopping behavior because it's pretty important. And what happens is we usually bring it down to some really simple level. We design products that take into account basic male desires for sleeping and watching television, right? It's a, it's a, it's a lampoon of a notion of what males are all about. But it turns out that, that they're now reporting that 51, 52% of all grocery shopping in households is being done by males. It's not a predominantly female activity anymore. And we know more about behavior on submarines than we know about behavior in grocery stores. Right? It's, it's incredible. And we, I, I mean social science in general, not just marketers. All right? So there's an awful lot of obvious behaviors going on in the environment that we don't know very much about that are really important. One of the things that we'll try to do in the marketing curriculum is keep you focused on stuff like this. You'll be uh, you know, reading uh, textbooks and articles and, and doing cases and so forth, but we always kind of try to bring your attention back to what's actually going on in the world in your own experience as, as kind of grist for uh, uh, your interpretation, for your introspection and so forth, for making sense of your uh, own life. All right, so we, we operate in an environment now where anywhere in the world that you go, you're going to encounter the same brands, right, the same products and services, the same competitors everywhere you go, which makes you feel like you're living in a global village. You're really not, right? Even though these things are available everywhere, the, phys the physical or the tangible things, they have pretty dramatically different meanings from place to place, all right? So every global brand is, is global only in a limited sense. It, it takes an understanding of local consumer behavior in order to really uh, um, uh, create uh, an effective marketing plan for these so-called global brands in local country markets. If you're in Tokyo, if you're in Japan, you're wearing an iPod, you're using an iPod so that you don't disturb other people. Right? In Chicago, you wear it so other people don't disturb you. It's, it's a completely different way of thinking about this product. The, the guts are the same, the electronics are the same, but the meaning of the brand is going to be wildly different, right? So your job as a marketer is to understand what your product means in different markets around the world so that you can uh, adjust your strategy as necessary as you go. It's just an example of the uh, extreme that you can go a new product development and taking, uh, taking into account some, uh, some things like iPods and iPads. The Pope wears Prada, right? Pope wears Serengeti sunglasses. Right? He's, he's not an active promoter or spokespeople, or spokesperson, spokespope for, uh, for any of these brands, but the essence of the papacy 
colors these brands, right? So that in consumers' minds, they, they will associate some degree of sacramentality with these profane kinds of products. And that's another kind of example of what we do as marketers, try to understand the interplay between people, products, and services. All right, this is a, a, a list of uh, faculty members in our department. Um, most of these folks here, let me see if I can, uh, this will do a little bit better. These are the folks who teach undergraduate courses in marketing. Uh, the folks in black are our um, uh, regular TNR faculty. The folks in red are adjunct professors. Adjuncts are active practitioners. They are current managers or uh, fairly recent current managers, right? folks that are very up to date on practice in the marketing field. The faculty uh, who are primarily teaching and, and research faculty are also current with marketing practice, right? They, uh, many of us, most of us are active industry consultants so that even though you'll hear theory from us in the classroom, you'll also get a lot of practical examples, right? And what we've tried to do is to set up a curriculum that, that will give you knowledge and understanding of marketing that's really rooted in, in contemporary examples. So plenty of theory, but lots of uh, uh, active examples to, to ground that theory in. So the idea is that uh, between a, a, a good mixture of theorizing about marketing and seeing how it actually plays out on the ground, we create a toolkit for you that generalizes to whatever industry you end up working in. Okay, it's a, it's a distinguished faculty. The folks that are teaching you in the undergraduate curriculum are past presidents of professional societies. They are journal editors, current or past journal editors. They've won lifetime achievement awards. They work on editorial boards. They've written award-winning articles. They write books. They make lots of professional presentations to uh, um, um, professional marketing conferences around the world. They are literally the thought leaders of the discipline. All right, so um, again, unlike many other programs, we have a cluster of folks that have not just national eminence, but international. Uh, eminence. They're all experts in particular functional areas of marketing, right? We have people that are specialists in pricing and channels and new product development and so forth, right? So you're getting good functional marketing training from these folks. But also, everybody on the faculty has this central interest in the impact of marketing on society. We call it marketing and society, we call it marketing in society. But the idea is that what we do as marketers affects the larger environment in a, in a very profound way. And so each of our courses is going to have that as a sub-theme or a subtext, right? Because again, it's important since you are, you're shaping the world along with creating products and services, we need to get that understanding through loud and clear. That's a unique positioning to Notre Dame. We are, we are virtually the only place in the country that has that marketing and society orientation. And uh, our students have found it hugely beneficial uh, over time. When uh, Dean Conlon talks to the MBA students about the brand that they are in the process of creating, he talks about the interaction between the student and the program, right? And, and as, uh, again, as Professor Conlon sees it, uh, we are trying to train you uh, uh, in terms of habits of mind, habits of heart, and habits of action, all right? And we're embedding you in a Mendoza culture that focuses on community, cooperation, and integrity. An awful lot of the work that you do in marketing is done in groups, right? There are individual assignments, but a lot of your education revolves around working on what the world calls interfunctional task forces or interdisciplinary task forces. You learn to work with people that have dramatically different views of the marketplace than you do and different, different work ethics, different value systems, and so forth. Right? And so a, a big part of your training occurs outside the classroom as you're immersed in the culture of Mendoza. Right? And, that's, and that's, again, a, a huge differentiating factor between what we do here and what goes on in other schools. We look at marketing on four levels. All right? and, and I've mostly rehearsed this for you already. We try to look at uh, uh, basic orientation to the marketplace. We teach you how and, and where to compete. We look at tactics that will deliver and sustain value over time, and we look at the impact that you have on all the environments that you operate in. All right, so the top, the top three would be primarily functional, primarily tactical, strategic in the business sense. That bottom one is looking at impact across all environments. 
There's nowhere you can go in the world to escape the impact of brands, all right? A few years ago, we had that horrible campus shooting spree, and when people gathered together to console each other, and they held, held those votive candles, the candles were surrounded by brand, all right? Brand is an intimate part of your world. If you look at what's going on in the Middle East right now, right, as, as uh, uh, these revolutions start to flare, Here's a guy uh, that's stacked, or a couple of guys that stacked up uh, some, some throwing rocks on a, on a mobile cart, right? And so everywhere this, this picture is flashed in the world, you've got images not only of revolution, but of brand. And again, marketing and politics are intimately intertwined as, as we move around the world. This one uh, uh, came up just the other day, and I find it absolutely fascinating. The folks that are uh, uh, kind of strategizing as, as things are going down in Tahrir Square, right? Are, are meeting around the table. <clears throat> and what, uh, I guess this isn't all that clear, but they're clustered around an Apple computer. There's a can of Coke on the table. If the resolution was a little bit more clear, you'd see that that guy on the top right was wearing a Johnny Cash t-shirt where Johnny Cash was flipping the bird to, uh, to the audience at Folsom Prison. Um, you're just surrounded by brands, and people use brands to, to create the worlds that they live in, right? And so again, as, as uh, uh, part of your education will help you unpack that whole process, right? So our goal in the marketing department is basically to you know, prepare you to assume productive careers, to understand decision-making processes, to develop informed decision-making strategies within your organization, and recognize that there's an ethical and moral component to everything that you do. Right? That's, that's, in a nutshell, what we try to accomplish uh, um, through our curriculum. I've tried to map the courses out here for you in a way that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> you all take a, a core course in principles that gives you the foundations and the fundamentals of marketing and hopefully piques your curiosity as far as uh, the kinds of things you might like to study a little bit further down the road. Right? So uh, the core course in principles, we have required courses in marketing research and in consumer behavior. All right, so again, foundational courses. Uh, another required course at the end of your senior year is a capstone course uh, in strategic marketing. Right? The idea is that you pull together everything that you've learned in the required courses and in the electives, uh, and you put that to work in a simulation where you compete against other teams in the marketplace where you run your own corporations. All right, so the, the curriculum is, is cumulative. We start out giving you really strong fundamentals in, in the core areas, allow you then to kind of branch out into electives as you go. We teach electives in professional selling, in product innovation and pricing, in integrated marketing communication. Uh, we have courses in marketing and technology and advertising campaigns and public relations. We have a, a very successful uh, recently introduced class on, on branding, building great brands. All right, so you can see we try to we bounce you around the curriculum in a way that uh, 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 builds really uh, 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 great strength in the fundamental areas. There's a course that Professor Wilkie teaches, <clears throat> the, uh, the marketing seminar up there uh, that he usually calls uh, 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 Exploring the Frontiers of Marketing. We don't have a PhD program here in Mendoza, and uh, a lot of us enjoy working with PhD students, and the next best thing to a PhD student is a really bright undergraduate. So Professor Wilkie handpicks uh, a class to participate in a seminar that looks uh, a lot like a doctoral seminar, where you read uh, uh, important marketing articles from the major scholarly journals, and you discuss them and kind of unpack the meanings and uh, uh, assess the, uh, you know, the importance and the impact of the findings for your own careers. All right? Every once in a while, we're, we're lucky enough to convince somebody to divert out of a professional career as, as a practicing manager and into the academic realm of, of, of marketing. It's possible to earn a PhD in marketing. Uh, we would love to identify people that are interested in going on and studying for a PhD in marketing and, and encouraging them wherever we can, right? So your career path can go in a lot of different directions. <clears throat> this is uh, just a quick roadmap. Uh, uh, in, in most of our um, uh, MBA courses, uh, in fact, in a lot of MBA courses around the country, there's a common template into which courses will fit. Right, to make sure that we cover all, all of the basic uh, uh, grounds in, in uh, business practice from uh, um, 
marketing analytics through creating value, capturing value to sustaining value. You can see that we have courses mapped into each one of those boxes, all right? So that by the time you've, you've completed your major, you are, are really thoroughly familiar with, with all the marketing basics. Okay. This is roughly what your schedule would look like uh, going forward. You start with principles, all right? Then you can take consumer behavior and marketing research. There's a required elective, right, that, that you are free to choose from all the electives that we offer. And then strategic marketing, as I said, is our capstone course, all right? So this is the basic flow of required courses. And then you have a number of choices of electives as you go. Many of our majors, uh, in some years, most of our majors double in something else, right? So it's, it's very common to find marketing and psychology double majors, marketing and sociology or anthropology. Right? The idea here is that marketing is about the most interdisciplinary of the business disciplines. Uh, if you're a marketing major, you are kind of inherently curious about different ways of knowing. And so it's, it's possible to combine a lot of other majors uh, or minors with your marketing degree uh, fairly effectively and in a practical way. We have a lot of design students right, that will take a, like a design focus in their courses, where others may be more economically oriented. All right, so a lot, lot of ways to work out uh, uh, double majors. We are predominantly a female major, all right? And I, I run focus groups every year, uh, uh, exit interviews with seniors to try and understand how our program is working out. But right now we're running about 70% female. And the nearest I come to an explanation from students at this point is uh, that the women seem to prefer being able to combine um, the rigor of, of quantitative analysis with the creativity of a behavioral science or humanistic approach to marketing. What I hear consistently from students is we get to use both sides of our brain. It's not all math, but it's not all qualitative either. I think that that's a, that's a fairly accurate kind of a description of what we do. <clears throat> I just put this up because uh, I knew Doug was going to joke a little bit about my background. I pulled this from, uh, from the Observer one year. Uh, where the guy is talking about uh, being in a quandary about double majoring and so forth, and he's chosen anthropology as a double major, and, and uh, the guy is saying, geez, you're screwed, right? Clearly, you're not screwed. I, I majored in anthropology and ended up doing this for a living, and the, and the two dovetail really nicely. Uh, as I said, marketing marries up really well with any of the other interests that you're likely to develop. Okay? Um, so again, just a, a roster of the of double majors that... Uh, that we might find in the department. We have a very active marketing club, right, in, in terms of uh, uh, other ways of, of supplementing your education. Marketing club is active in a, in a number of ways. Uh, they take on projects during the year. They work in case competitions. Uh, it's, it's a great way to, to, uh, to meet and, and work with your professors at a, at a deeper level than just in classroom ac activities. We have an advertising club that was launched this year, so if you're interested in advertising, um, um, this, this new club has developed a really interesting schedule of uh, activities, of speakers, of mentors, and so forth. We also have recently launched, um, oh, I have a slide for it, I guess I don't. We've launched a, a, a brand um, strategy and advertising agency at the student level, right? So right now we have two student groups participating in essentially consulting projects, working with real world firms to develop advertising strategies and brand strategies for them. Right? So lots of different ways to get involved outside of the classroom. A lot of uh, text on this slide, uh, and, and I'm not gonna go over it in, in any detail other than to stress this one point. We don't think of you guys as customers. Right? A real common paradigm in, in higher education right now says that students are customers. I've got a series of quotes from a dean at the University of Chicago, right? one of the top-ranked business programs, uh, top-ranked MBA programs, stressing why it's important not to think of you guys as customers, right? and why the customer in this case is not always right. right? The customer is not always right. We go with a version of you get what you put into it. right? So we expect a lot out of you. We expect interaction in the classroom. It's not just a, a, a dry reading of textbooks and a, and a spitting back of facts on, on a set of exams. Classrooms are very interactive, right? And again, we think of you primarily as students and as learners rather than as customers, right? This guy says there isn't anything wrong with a teacher-student relationship. It's only been around for two or three millennia, right? 
So again, we don't think of you as customers. We think of you, if anything, as products that we're trying to shape. Right? Here's a quick snapshot of salaries over time. Once you uh, graduate, we launch into the, into the real world. You can expect to earn, on average, about $50,000 a year. Here is a kind of a, a quick survey of the kinds of firms and the kinds of positions that you're likely to end up in. This would be the, uh, uh, the 2000 and most recent 2010 data we have. So you can see we have uh, you know, people working for firms like Abercrombie & Fitch, uh, for Baxter Healthcare, Campbell's Soup, uh, Creata, Dunhumby, EJ Gallo, right? and again at various levels, sales associate, uh, account executives, some are research positions. All right, so General Mills, IBM, J. Walter Thompson. So you're scattered pretty well across industries, right, across job categories, and, and pretty much across the country as well. All right, and we've got uh, um, a few of our students that go on. I think I've got some data here. A few of them go on into higher education. I may, may go on and immediately take an MBA, maybe go to law school. Uh, some folks end up in the military. Uh, other folks take some uh, uh, other service commitments and so forth. So a lot of interesting uh, different career paths open to you. And again, just a, kind of a summary of, of where our students are going. We have the best career placement service in the universe here. Right? There, there is no better uh, group of people dedicated to helping you discern a career and actually find a career in interns, uh, internships. So we always urge you to connect with the career services people as soon as possible. Right? You can have actually multiple internships before you have to make that decision about your first job. Um, we work closely with them. They have uh, one uh, advisor in particular, Ken Kevin Monahan, who is dedicated to marketing, who will look after you personally and again, guide you through career discernment and placement. It's never too early to get in, in uh, contact with those folks because they'll, they'll just do you a world of good. Right? I think that's it. I think I've covered all the, all the bases that I'm familiar with. Um, if there are specific questions that I can help answer. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's harder. They, they come about later. I think uh, the information about these, mark the, the marketing market clears a, bit, a little bit later than some of these others. Finance is our biggest major, and so you're going to hear uh, uh, numbers being higher just because of the sheer volume of finance majors. But I think percentage-wise, it's, it's no more difficult to get a job in marketing than it is in any of the other fields. Sadly, you're a little bit underpaid with rep uh, respect to your other uh, uh, disciplinary uh, friends and neighbors. Uh, your initial salary is going to be a little bit lower, but, but uh, your salary trajectory later on takes off a little bit more quickly. So you make it up in the middle and the end of your career. I can, I can add to that. Uh, sure. The Career Center is going to release spring 10 data here in about, about another week. As soon as they do, we'll bring that into the class and see what's happening in the spring 10 class. Uh, but all majors in the college of business were, were placed at 98% in the three months of graduation from the spring 10 class. And I'm not sure if my figures are exactly right, but for the first three years after you graduate, the career services people look after you before turning you over to the alumni, excuse me, the alumni association. We have the most enthusiastic, loyal, uh, energetic alumni base on the planet. Uh, it's an incredible tribal vibe that these people share, uh, and, and people are just committed to having you find your career, launching your career, and, and sustain it. Other questions about courses, professors, attitudes, anything like that? Yeah. You just named a few the requirements for marketing um, There would be requirements that were and I only saw four or five requirements. Yeah. What exactly are just the four Your basic intro course principles. Uh, the, the next most logical jump then would be consumer behavior, marketing research, those are both required. You can take those.
on the front of it, right? Uh, you're, you're required to take an elective, right? Uh, that elective currently is free. You can choose whichever one you want to satisfy that. Right. right. We have a curriculum committee uh, right now that's looking at, uh, uh, again, continuously revising the curriculum. And maybe if we decide that a particular course should be elevated to uh, a requirement, then we'll take that elective thing out there. So you've got uh, uh, any elective of your choice. Strategic marketing is the capstone course that you take your second semester, second year. And then there are two other electives that you can take in the curriculum somewhere. Again, yeah, up to you, whatever they might be. I see you can end up with a, uh, uh, you know, a curriculum that, that leads more in the direction of uh, quantitative issues, more in the direction of qualitative issues, or all kinds of balance. Thank you, Dr. Sure. Sure. Thank you.